tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. No mai, haere mai, welcome to the second seminar of 2024 for the University of Auckland Early Childhood Seminar Series. We'll begin our time together with karakia, me inoi tātou. Tū tawa mai i runga, tū tawa mai i raro, tū tawa mai i roto, tū tawa mai i waho. Kia tau ai, te mauri tū, te mauri ora, ki te katoa. Haumie, huie, tae kie. Thank you for joining us for today's presentation by Dr Liz Chesworth from the University of Sheffield in England. We're delighted to have Liz visiting us here in New Zealand and grateful for her willingness to share her current research on the possibilities and challenges of curriculum making with young children. If any questions arise for you during the presentation that you would like to ask Liz, please use the Q and A function at the bottom of your screen and she'll respond to them at the end of her presentation. You can always use the chat function throughout the presentation to connect with each other and the panelists. After the seminar, a recording will be available on our Early Childhood Seminar Series YouTube channel. I will now pass over to Professor Helen Hedges to welcome and introduce Dr. Liz Chesworth. Thanks, Helen. Kia ora, Justine. Tēnā koutou katoa. As our speakers fly are noted, today's presentation is built on the premise that children's everyday lives offer potentially rich resources for curriculum making in early childhood education. Yet children's everyday lives are often seen in contrast to their academic lives in schooling and policy documents with push-down effects to early childhood education. How might we locate and justify rich resources for teaching and learning to enrich our understandings, ensure curriculum and pedagogy are responsive to the interests of children, family and communities, and advocate to policymakers in particular contexts that our approaches are valued and valuable. To consider these questions and concepts today, I'm delighted to introduce and welcome our seminar speaker, Dr. Liz Chesworth. Liz began her career as a primary school teacher. After teaching for some time, she took on a leadership role for an early childhood teacher education program in Leeds. Her ongoing commitment to teachers and children continues in her current academic career, where Liz became a staff member at the University of Sheffield in 2017, now teaching on postgraduate programs. Her research projects use approaches that empower children to be participants. In some projects, inviting children's perspectives has enabled her to explore and identify issues of power, agency and choice within peer cultures in early childhood and junior school settings. In two recent projects that Liz has led, she has collaborated with teachers to identify strategies for curriculum decision making that are responsive to young children's diverse interests and lived experiences. It is one of these projects that she shares with us today. No mai, haere mai, a warm welcome to you, Liz. We're delighted to have you with us today and over to you. Thank you so much, Justine, and thank you so much, Helen, for that very warm welcome. Um, and I must say that it is um, a real treat and a real honour um, to be with all of you um, this afternoon in New Zealand, um, a place that for those of us in England has always been sort of held up as, um, as, as a very exciting um, place where there's lots of very important and interesting ideas that are going on about young children, about teaching and about early childhood education. So it really is um, a treat and an honour to be with you um, here today. Um, I'm just going to minimise my, so I can't see myself talking um, and I can see my slides. So hopefully you can all see my slides okay. Oh, now I can't click, hold on. Okay, there we go. So I want to start um, today's um, presentation with actually um, rather a self-indulgent um, story about me when I was a little girl. Um, so this picture is me aged about four years old. And if we were all together in the room, I might be asking you a question now, like, can you guess what I was pretending to be? 
Um, and many of you, I guess, will probably um, uh, look at the clues and look at me holding those sticks up and think, I think maybe that um, Liz was pretending to be a deer. And if you had that as your, as your guess, then you would be 100% right. Um, so when I was a little girl, um, Sunday afternoons were always, or nearly always, um, a, a, um, a visit to our local park, Knoll Park, which was just outside of South East London, where I grew up. And every Sunday afternoon, I would go there with my mum and my dad and my younger sister, and sometimes our grandparents and our aunties and uncles. And Knoll Park and the things that we did at Knoll Park became a very important part of, of, of who I was and the things that I did with, with my family. And as a result of those, um, oh, I should give you a bit more background that um, the reason, one of the reasons we went to Knoll Park was it was because um, there was a particular tree in the park where um, some years before my dad had proposed to my mum and my mum had said, yes, darling, I will marry you. So that tree became part of our Sunday afternoon walks. And um, although it was very romantic to hear about it, as you can probably imagine, after a while, me and my sister used to groan and say, yes, dad, yes, mum, we know what happened at this tree. We know that it was the, you know, the, 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 where, where you proposed and so on. But what really interested me and my sister was all of the things that you could find and discover in Knoll Park. And especially when my grandpa used to come with us, who was a real advocate of nature, we would go off exploring with grandpa. Um, and I don't know if you can see, but just on the tree line at the background, um, you can see a sort of fuzz of brown, or you might be able to see that. And that was a herd of deer that were resident within the park that I guess inspired um, my deep interest in all things um, in the natural world, really. Now, the significance of this story is not just a self-indulgent memory from my childhood, but I wanted to connect that with what we're talking about this afternoon, because as a child, when I went to nursery, I think that's your equivalent of, of kindergarten, when I was three and four years old, um, I was very quiet. Um, and I can, I've got very clear memories of spending a lot of time drawing pictures of deer and drawing pictures of the trees and the other things that were important to me as a child, um, but also of running around, um, you know, involved in that very deep imaginative play where I was creating my own scenarios where I was a deer and I was playing with other deer. But I guess to my teachers, they probably never tuned into the significance of those things. Because in common with many four-year-olds, my pictures of deer didn't necessarily look like deer. They maybe looked a little bit like scribble to the teachers. Um, and my running around de didn't necessarily have any significance. So I guess when, um, if we maybe could go back in time and ask the teachers, what do you think Liz was interested in? They might have said, well, she spent a lot of time drawing and she spent a lot of time running around. Um, and those things would have been right, of course. But if those teachers had had some opportunities to maybe dig a little bit deeper, they would have found out that actually those things that I was doing when I was in nursery had far more significance and, and connected very closely with the things that were important to me as a young child and actually still are as an adult in terms of that deep interest in the natural world and also the things that were significant to, to my family. So that really leads into this, the sort of like the, 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 the core principle of the things that I'm wanting to share with you this afternoon. And just to give a bit of an overview of what I'm, I'm hoping to cover, I'm going to start with a very brief summary of curriculum in early childhood education policy in England. Um, it is gonna be very brief because it's not a happy story and I don't want everyone to, to feel gloomy um, this, this evening. But I think it's important because it gives a really important context for the story that I'm going to go on to tell about the, um, the curriculum making project. So I'm then going to give um, a little bit of an overview of the project um, that I've been working on very recently. In fact, we, we're continuing. We've just got some funding to continue it. And then I'm going to focus on some of the changes um, that teachers um, made as a result of participating in that project. So I guess I want to start, because this presentation is about curriculum making, I think it's important to start with asking some of those big questions around curriculum. 
in terms of who is it that decides um, what curriculum looks like and feels like? Um, where do those decisions about curriculum happen? Um, what's the purpose of curriculum? And what are the outcomes? And I want you to almost think about those as important strands that are going to be connecting all the way through this presentation. And we'll be returning to those questions right at the very end. And because obviously you're working in New Zealand um, in a very different um, cultural, social, and also policy context, it might be helpful for you as I'm talking through the examples from England to reflect on the ways in which your context is similar, but also significantly differs to the things that I'll be talking about with you um, in terms of, of, of the project in, in England. So I'm going to start with thinking about some of those questions in relation to that English policy context. I'm guessing some of you might know a little bit about it um, and others of you might not know um, much or anything at all, and that's fine. Um, and I'm only going to give, as I say, a very brief overview. And as you will, um, you will discover, um, I'm, think, I'm, I'm talking quite critically, really, about policy, um, because the policy context in England is, 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 um, creates a lot of challenges um, for, for, for teachers. And for, um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about educators, actually, um, rather than teachers. Um, and I know that that's different um, in, in New Zealand. But when I talk about educators, you can sort of think that that probably equates to teachers. But in English policy over the last um, 20, um, maybe 25 years, we've had this increasing emphasis on the main purpose from a policy context of early childhood being to prepare children for the next stage in school. So our curriculum framework for early childhood is called the Early Years Foundation Stage, and that is a framework for, for children from birth up to five years of age. Um, and then the next phase of schooling at the beginning of primary school is known as key stage one. So in policy, there's this big focus on early childhood being a site for preparing children for school. We talk a lot about this idea, and um, I talk about it um, quite critically, about this idea of school readiness. And associated with that, we've got um, a series of statutory early learning goals. Um, that children are expected to achieve by the end of the early years foundation stage. So that's when children are five years old. And those early learning goals have over time become increasingly focused on quite narrow academic skills, particularly related to numeracy and literacy. Um, and one of the real challenges is that teachers are held accountable through our inspection system for the progress that children make towards those early learning goals. So as you can probably imagine, that has actually resulted in, um, in really quite an, a, a danger of, of children having quite a narrow curriculum um, where teachers, despite their best intentions, feel under pressure um, to really focus on those early learning goals at the expense of a much broader, holis more holistic curriculum. So this is just a couple of quotations from previous projects from educators reflecting on some of the challenges that this sort of standardized approach to curriculum has created. So here's one educator saying, you know, I think a lot of practitioners kind of always have in the back of their head when they're thinking about um, experiences for young children, about what goals have children met, what goals haven't they met. So in effect, curriculum prep planning becomes driven by the gaps that children have got in terms of those early learning goals that, that you know, is it, really challenging. And here's another educator um, uh, saying that everything um, in her practice is about making sure that children meet targets, targets, targets. And she was reflecting on how sometimes other things that children are doing can be missed because you're so focused on picking up specific things. And when she talks about specific things, again, she's talking about picking up specific things that give her evidence to show that her children are making progress towards those early learning goals. So another thing that, um, that is, is, is challenging in our policy context in England is that, um, that the politics of curriculum at the moment um, in, our, in our education system are such that curriculum content is seen as disconnected 
from children's everyday lives. So the very opposite of the, 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 the principles that I'm um, sort of advocating for. So this is um, a, a quotation from someone called Nick Gibb, who has been extremely powerful and an extremely um, influential politician um, in our education um, policy over the last 15 years or so, um, where he says very controversially and based on very limited evidence that a curriculum based on relevance to pupils is to deny them an introduction to the best that has been thought and said. So, you know, I, I, I could spend all day um, talking to you about the problems of that. Um, and I'm sure you can al already see some of the dangers of a politician saying something like that. Um, but I just want that to sort of stay in your mind as you, as you, you hear the rest of the presentation. And finally, again, that because um, of, of this, this, this drive towards curriculum in school being seen in policy as very different to children's everyday lives, that has been associated with rather a deficit framing of diverse social and cultural um, experiences. Um, so this is again a quotation from Nick Gibb. Um, I would agree with him that we cannot anymore in England ignore the evidence that shows that pupils from less advantaged backgrounds are less likely to be successful in our education system. I agree with that. But the problem is that Gibb um, and other politicians are framing that as a problem of the children and families rather than a problem of the education system. And I've highlighted this example where he says that children from less advantaged backgrounds are less likely to have rich conversations at the family dinner table. And the reason I'm highlighting that is because conversations at the family dinner table are really reflective of a particular sort of, of family activities that in England would often be associated with with maybe fairly affluent, mainly white families. Um, and of course, um, my issue is that rich conversations don't just happen at the family dinner table. They might happen at the family dinner table, but in effect, what Gibb is doing when he says this is he is sort of like saying that other um, activities that families might engage in, in, in diverse social and cultural contexts are less important. So he's, he's sort of perpetuating this rather deficit framing of diversity. So that is enough of the English policy context, um, but hopefully it gives you a flavor of some of the challenges that teachers are operating within. What I want to talk about now is a project where I've been working with groups of teachers to move away from these rather deficit approaches of, of, of curriculum delivery to a more of an assets-based approach to curriculum making that involves teachers and families and children. So this idea of curriculum making has been written about by lots of people, but we've been particularly inspired in this project um, by the work of, of Mark Priestley and, Scott, uh, um, and colleagues who are, are working in Scotland, looking at curriculum making, not just in early childhood, but across education. And they say that curriculum making happens um, in lots of different sites. So curriculum making happens in terms of global policy for education, right down to the decisions that those of you who are teachers are making on a day-to-day, minute-by-minute basis. And that's and it's that 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 um, curriculum making that's happening in classrooms and early childhood settings, what they call the nano level that we're really interested in and focused upon in this project. So framing this idea of curriculum making as pedagogic interactions and events that happen and unfold within our classrooms and settings that involve teachers, but also involve students. We would, would tend to refer to them as children, wouldn't we, in early childhood rather than students. So to help us in this project think about that curriculum making activity, we've drawn on the work um, of, of, of a curriculum theorist um, called Ted Aoki, who sadly is no longer with us, but has been very influential um, in lots of people's thinking. Here's a lovely photograph of him um, reading a, a, a pamphlet, I think, with one of his grandchildren. So Aoki, Aoki talks about curriculum in two different ways. He talks about curriculum as plan. Um, we could interpret that as the, um, the sort of curriculum that has been pre-planned by adults and that in England incorporates those statutory early learning goals. But Aoki also talks about this really important idea of the curriculum as being lived, not something that we can pre-plan. 
And in early childhood, that's the curriculum that we're so familiar with that unfolds in response to children's interests, experiencing as experiences and ideas. Um, and those, those, those ideas um, happen and we can notice them in our interactions um, with children and as we observe and participate in their play. Now, if we go back to the English context, I think what sadly has happened is the, the pressures that, that educators are under has meant that curriculum as planned has come to dominate the way that we talk about curriculum. And the curriculum as lived has been marginalized and sometimes actually pushed out of our classrooms and early childhood settings altogether. So the aim of this project has been to bring those two um, aspects of curriculum together and to think with educators about how they can still be accountable to their statutory duties um, for, for those early learning goals, but also to make sure that the way that they um, enable children to progress towards those early learning goals um, reflect the things that are important and significant in children's lives. So squashing together the curriculum as plan and the curriculum as lived. So in our project, um, we've asked two um, research questions. We've asked how can educators recognize, respect and respond to children's interests and ideas in socially and culturally diverse contexts? And how can this process inform curriculum making that is meaningful to children, but that also incorporates those early learning goals that teachers are, are, are held accountable to? Um, and I've been working with teachers um, and educators in a variety of different settings in this project, but the project that I'm going to focus on and talk to you about um, this afternoon is a project with a school um, in London called Wingfield Primary School. And this aspect of the project has been funded um, by one of the research councils um, in, in, in England, the Economic and Social Research Council. And the focus of the project has been upon collaboration so um, three um, people from the University of Sheffield, me, my colleague, and um, Professor Elizabeth Wood, some of you might um, be familiar with her work, and also Beth Nutbrown has been working with us, and then five educators from Wingfield Primary School. So we're like the, the core project members. Um, a little bit um, about Wingfield Primary. So it's located in an area of London that some of you might be familiar with um, near Greenwich. So if you've ever been um, on holiday to England and you've visited London, you might have visited Greenwich. It's famous for its park. It's famous for um, have the, the, the line, the Greenwich Mean Time line in terms of sort of time zones. It's famous for um, a very famous ship called the Cutty Sark. Um, and it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a great place. It's a very culturally diverse part of London. Um, and Wingfield School is, is located quite close to Greenwich Park in an area called Kidbrook that um, is, is very socially and culturally diverse and many different languages um, that, are, that are spoken within the school. Here's a photograph of the school just so that you can get a little bit of a flavor of it. It's a huge school. Um, it has children from the age of three up to the age of 11. Um, and there are about 670 children on roll. So I don't know how that compares with um, schools in New Zealand, but for a primary school um, in England, that's quite big. Um, and the focus of this project was the, the two nursery classes um, that have provision for children aged three, and then the three reception classes, which have um, provision for children aged four and five. And you can see, um, you might be able to see in the photograph, a fenced off area um, that the architects decided to, to, um, to, to coat with multicolored flooring. That's the reception area. And that reception area, that outside space is for 90 children. Um, so one of the real challenges that teachers are grappling with is very, very small spaces. Um, and children that are mainly living in apartments and flats. Um, it looks very green, um, but in actual fact, that green area is quite deceptive. Um, there's, there's very little green area beyond the, the, the Greenwich Park. Um, so that's quite a concern for teachers. And our current um, phase of the project is actually focusing on what teachers can do 
to enhance children's um, access to quality outdoor and um, play and learning. So this is taken from um, the school's website um, where they say that their vision is to create a school community focused on the learner, both child and adult. So remembering that you know schools are communities where everyone is learning, not just the children, but also parents, carers and teachers. And this is something I wanted to highlight. If you think about the policy context, where there's this sort of, you know, this everything needs to be the same, a very standardised approach to curriculum. This school is determined to do things differently and to recognise and celebrate and value that everyone is different and to think about how they can build a curriculum that celebrates and respects that difference in diversity. So the key ideas that have underpinned our project um, are really ideas that um, I guess you might be quite familiar with, um, um, with your um, Tefariki curriculum that is a social cultural curriculum, but is less familiar to educators in England. So drawing on um, some of those key ideas from Vygotsky, that in complete contrast to what Nick Gebb Gibbs says, what Vygotsky argues is actually children's everyday experiences um, and their academic knowledge need to work together in the process of children's learning. And um, so based on that, children build their knowledge and deepen their understanding when there's a two-way relationship between their experiences at home. Let's think back to my example of when I was um, visiting Knoll Park with my family and pretending to be a deer with my antler, antlers and the experiences that they have in schools and settings. So in other words, if teachers had, an, had had an opportunity to be a little bit more attuned to what I was doing when I was making my scribbly marks and running around pretending to be a deer when they thought it was random running, um, what they might have had opportunities to do was to create a curriculum um, where knowledge arising from home and school context could actually interact and enrich each other. So they're the sort of theoretical ideas that are underpinning the project. And we've drawn very closely um, on Helen Hedges and her colleagues work here in New Zealand to think about how children's interests can offer educators almost a bridge or a way of connecting those home and school contexts and how children's interests can help teachers to recognize children as active contributors to curriculum making, how it can help them to respect children's everyday lives and crucially in that process of curriculum making how that can enable them to be responsive to children's ideas, their interests and their diverse experiences. So again, drawing on Helen's work, um, we know that interests um, um, are, are so often around the world seen as something that is a really important starting point for curriculum in early childhood. But often we know from Helen's research, but also from research that, that I've done um, in England amongst other people, that quite often as adults, there's a danger that we might interpret children's interests as activity choices rather than those fundamental sources, as Helen says, of knowledge, inquiry and identity construction, children's sense of who they are. So again, if we link what Helen says back to my example of, of, of me as a child, um, I guess we can, um, we can give that as an example, can't we, where maybe if we'd have gone back to talk to my teachers, they might have interpreted what I was doing in terms of my activity choices, wanting to draw, wanting to be physically active, rather than to dig a little bit more deeply to think about, well, you know, what is Liz doing when she's drawing? What is she doing when she's running around? What ideas are important to her and how can we build on those? So what we've done in the project, working with those um, teachers at Wingfield School, is thinking about how we can work together towards a deeper understanding of children's interests and ideas. Um, and in one of the um, um, early project meetings, um, we identified um, that knowing children really well, um, these, these, those bits in blue are teachers' words, um, that knowing children really well was really important so that the learning outcomes linked to the early learning goals could unfold in contexts that were relevant for the children. So together we identified um, as a starting point, um, uh, three key things that we wanted to do um, to enhance um, practice. The first was thinking about um, how educators could make small changes to their practice 
in order to get to know children in their worlds a little bit better. This is something that they were already doing really well at the school. Um, but as we know, um, uh, practice is, is never finished, is it? We, we can never say that we're the perfect um, educator, or perhaps once we think we're the perfect educator, that might be the time for us to move on to something else, because we're always learning. Um, so we identified some key things that the teachers wanted to do in order to get to know children and their worlds a little bit better. Um, and the first of those was thinking about how they could enhance their, their home to school transition for new children. And one of the things that they identified was they, that they really wanted to focus on developing their home visits practices. And the second thing that they identified they wanted to do was to think about ways that they could create more of a two-way dialogue or a conversation with children and families. So thinking first of all, first of all, let me have a gulp of water. That's a bit tricky to say. Sorry about that, folks. So first of all, about that homeschool transitions and home visits. So actually at the school, they had always offered um, families a home visit. Um, not all families um, accepted that offer. But what they decided to do was that they really, really wanted to drive home on the value of those home visits. But before the project started, the home visits um, tended to be an opportunity for educators to visit families at home and really to share with them information about what would happen when their child started school and how they could how families could prepare their child for that transition. And as a result of this project, they have completely changed the emphasis of those home visits. So they, they offer transition visits for families and children to the school. And it's those visits to the school before children formally start school when they talk about what you might expect um, to, to happen at the beginning of school. And they show families around the classrooms and around the settings. They talk about the sorts of routines that children will become familiar with. And as a result, their home visits now focus much more closely, in fact, almost exclusively on listening to children and families rather than on giving information to children and families. So as a project team, we identified three starting points for, to, for framing those home visits. And we frame those as questions. Um, so in various ways, um, what educators focus on when they visit children at home is just very informal conversations about, tell us what's important for you as a family. What sorts of things do you get up to at the weekends? Um, you know, do you ever visit Greenwich Park? What sorts of things do you like to do? Tell us about other things that are important to you. And also, you know, what's important for, for you to the child? Um, and also directed to families, what's important to your child? And crucially, how do you think we might be able to help you or your child um, to settle into their new class when, when, they, when they join us at school? So completely tipping the focus round, as I say, from home visits being a place of sharing information to home visits being a place of establishing those reciprocal, respectful re relationships that are really focused on valuing what children and families have got to say. And once children have started, um, the other thing that um, educators decided they really wanted to focus in on this project was what very practical strategies could they introduce that built on their previous practice, but enabled them to actually sustain that two-way conversation with families. And they did this in lots of different ways. Um, they did this in terms of, of, for example, thinking about how making small changes to the beginning and end of their day and having slightly different routines would actually free um, educators up to talk with families rather than to be straight into carpet time, we call it in England, um, where the children came straight to the carpet. So now, instead of children gathering straight on the carpet, they have time when they're actually engaged in the play provision. And that frees the educators up to talk with families and to help children to settle in as well when they might be need a little bit of extra support. But the other example that I'm, I'm sharing with you on this slide is thinking about how they could use online tools as well, because a lot of the, um, the, the parents um, at Wingfield, well, about half of the parents, I guess, 
are working parents, so they don't necessarily have regular opportunities to actually meet face to face with the educators. So they were really keen as a teaching team to think about how they could make better use of those online spaces to develop those relationships with families. Now, a lot of schools in England use an online information sharing sort of package called Tapestry. I don't know, I, I, I'm assuming it that, that that's a, a very sort of English thing because it's tailored towards our curriculum framework. And Tapestry is something that they had used at Wingfield for, for several years. But when we talked in some of those early project meetings, educators reflected that they were mainly using that online space as a space for capturing and documenting children's progress towards the early learning goals. Um, so, you know, using very familiar techniques, little, you know, observations, some longer narrative observations, photographs of things that children were doing annotated um, against the early learning goals. And parents have always at Wingfield had access to those resources. But what they were very keen to do in this project was to think about how they could make use of Tapestry to become more of an online space for conversation. So Tapestry actually looks a little bit like a social media tool. It looks a little bit like Facebook, but it's a closed space, of course. So only the parent of one particular child has, has access to their child space along with, with the teachers. So what they started doing was when they put a photograph up or they put a little observation up, they would um, um, add a question to parents to say, does this look like the sort of thing that your child does um, at home with you? Tell it, Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about how that connects with the things that are important for you at, at home. Um, so as Ross, the head teacher said, the project has changed the way that when he says they, he's talking about the early childhood team, um, use tapestry. It's shifted from a one-way communication tool to more of a space for online dialogue and conversation. Um, and this is Danny, one of the educators at Wingfield School, um, kind of giving some substance to that. And you can see it's, it's, it's not rocket science. None of these things are rocket science. And I think that is the thing that makes them so important. They're these very, very small changes that actually have got potential to make quite a significant way, uh, change rather, to the way that educators interact with children and families. So Danny here is saying that parents have been using tapestry since the project started to tell us what they've been doing at home. For example, that daddy does a lot of cooking in the evening and things like that. And you think, I wonder what he cooks. And then you can have a conversation with the child about the meals that they make. So as I say, not rocket science, but really important stuff, I think. So here's another example um, of how connecting home and school context more closely um, has enabled um, children to feel more of a sense of belonging within their classroom communities. So this is a child um, that we've called Kieran. We've, we, we, we've kept the educators' names um, in this um, project because they are collaborators with the university-based researchers, um, but we've changed the children's names. Um, and when parents have requested it, we also have concealed the children's identities like here in the photographs. Um, so this is a child um, who we've called Kieran, four years old. She had been um, in the reception class um, for about three months when the project started. Um, and Kieran was a child that the teachers were, were a little bit worried about because she was having a lot of difficulties with getting settled at the beginning of the day. She was quite tearful. She was very quiet. She hadn't made um, uh, many friends um, in the reception classroom. Um, and what the teachers found was that as soon as they began to know a little bit more about what went on for Kieran at home, they were able to tune into the drawings and the sorts of things that she was doing in her play and to make more of a connection with her. I, I should have said that English is a third language for Kieran. She also speaks um, Hindi and she speaks Punjabi. Um, so as you can imagine, as, as a four-year-old just starting school, um, she's only just beginning to become competent in English, although she's a very skillful communicator in two, <laughs> two other languages already. But this is Jess um, talking here, one of um, Kieran's uh, teachers. And she says that, you know, Kieran has become far more animated since we've been able to tune into the sorts of things um, that she's doing. She's beginning to talk at carpet time and make a contribution to group conversations. And you can tell 
from her body language and her facial expressions, how pleased she is when we have conversations relating to her life at home. And this is a picture that Kieran had drawn. Um, and it's a collage actually, where she'd drawn some things and she'd painted some things and she'd cut them out and put them on this piece of paper. And when Jess shared this picture with Kieran's mum, um, Kieran's mum um, said, I think what she's talking, what, she, what she's representing here is, is puja. When as a Hindu family, we, we go to the temple um, and we leave various, um, various offerings. We also do this at home. So as a result of that, Jess, um, Kieran's um, educator, was able to find out a little bit more about that process, to find some books about it that she could look at with Kieran and so on. So that really, really fundamental right of all learners, however old we are, to feel a sense of belonging within our learning spaces. That is so crucial, isn't it, um, for, for, for children's learning and well-being and development. The other thing that we that came up as really important in terms of, of knowing children and their worlds was a lot of reflective discussions that we had as a project team about the place of popular culture. So before the project started, um, Wingfield had had a policy where um, children were discouraged really from talking about the things that they liked to watch on television, the things that they watched on YouTube, that sort of thing. But what we realized as we reflected together was if we're saying that we're committed to understanding and respecting children's sustained interests, for some children, those sustained interests are associated very closely with their favorite TV programs, their favorite TV characters. So we can see here from what the educators were saying that there's been a shift in the way that the school has thought about popular culture. And rather than saying to children, you know, we don't talk about that here, that's something that you do at home. They have thought very carefully about the ways in which popular culture can be used to bridge um, and to connect with some of the, the, the sort of curriculum learning that is, is, is going on in school as well. So yeah, again, just a small but really significant shift in their practice, I think. So we talked about um, uh, the first change, which was about knowing children and their worlds. The second change that I want to talk about um, is the changes that the educators made to the actual physical environments, the spaces for curriculum making. So they were, they, they, they identified that um, thinking about how they could offer children more space, um, more time and more flexible materials um, so that children could actually express and build upon their interests and ideas when they were inside and outside and in those outside um, uh, environments in nursery and reception. So they thought about how their spaces could become more flexible, how they could um, do really practical things. And again, for some of you, you might be thinking, my goodness me, this is so obvious. And it is obvious, but you know, it was a, a, a significant change for these educators. But how even things like taking the doors off cupboards so that children could actually see what was inside those shelves and could actually access resources made quite a significant change. Um, and also how they could think um, about um, making a, a provision resources available on a more continuous basis. So you can see some photographs here of some of those changes. Um, and again, this is um, one of the, uh, the educators saying, before we get things out of the cupboards and put things away, now there's not much hidden away stuff. Now they, the children, have got more chance to help themselves to what they want. And you can see also that they have thought very carefully on quite a limited budget about how introducing you know, thing, flexible resources like cardboard boxes, um, found materials, those sorts of things, can offer children more flexibility to explore and, and um, uh, add depth to their interests and ideas with the support and guidance of educators. So the third and final change that I want to talk about um, is this idea of, of the interactions that go on between children and between children and teachers are actually, um, as Mark Priestley reminded us earlier on, forms of curriculum making and absolutely crucial to the sorts of things that we were thinking about in the project. So moving from this very close focus on curriculum as plan, where before the project started, most of the educators' time was spent in adult-initiated activities, 
um, where they have moved much more towards thinking about spending time with the children, observing and responding to the things that are important to them, and thinking about how they can actually integrate their curriculum planning into those things that are important to children. And again, one of the reflections from one of the educators is, again, not rocket science, is it? But because we're planning fewer adult directed activities, as a result, we're spending more time with the children than we were before. So we know our children better, I think. And that, of course, um, teamed with all of those strategies that they've done to get to know more about what children do at home has really helped those interactions between children and adults to be far more attuned to the things that are important to children. So this is an example of Jess, one of the educators who noticed four-year-old Anna moving the chairs from around the tables in her classroom and arranging them in rows on the carpet area. Now that's the sort of thing that sometimes, especially when it's tidy up time, you might be very tempted as a, as a teacher to say, oh, Anna, just put those chairs back around the table. But because Jess had spoken with Anna's mum and had read on tapestry that the family had recently been to the theatre and that this was um, a regular and important experience for Anna, Jess understood that when Anna was rearranging all of these chairs in the classroom, it might have been that she was actually reflecting the arrangement of chairs in the theatre. And as a result of that, and respecting um, the things that Anna did at home, Jess talked with Anna about her experience of going to the theatre and found that indeed she was right, that what Anna was doing was recreating that experience. So as a result, Jess's interactions were able to be far more attuned to the things that were important for Anna and that reflected um, her, con her family context. And Jess encouraged other children to get involved in Anna's play. She suggested that they made theatre tickets. She introduced some money so that the children could buy and sell the tickets. And over the next few days and actually weeks, um, this developed into a project where Anna and her friends um, performed songs and dances for their, uh, for their peers. So being attuned to Anna's interest and her intentions led to meaningful opportunities for Jess to be able to think about how she could be responsive to the things that were important to Anna, but also how she could incorporate meaningful opportunities for Anna and her friends um, to have experiences that linked with those early learning goals in the early years foundation stage. I'm conscious of time, so I'm going to skip, skip across um, this example, but I guess if you're particularly interested, you can come back to this, but. This is another example um, of that same process for, for another child. So I guess to begin to sum up, um, in this project, we learned together as university-based researchers and school-based researchers working with children and families that curriculum making isn't um, a, a form of, of, of teachers delivering things to children. It actually takes place during those moment by moment interactions between children and adults, but also that enables adults to guide children to make connections, to build understanding and to, de to develop their knowledge and skills over time. So what we thought together very carefully was how the curriculum at Wingfield could actually weave together child initiated, adult facilitated and adult led experiences. Whereas in the past, those things had really been quite separate and the child initiated elements, as I say, had been to some extent marginalized or squashed out because of the pressures that those educators were under to be accountable for, for the early learning goals. So just to finish off, um, I just want to finish with some reflections on curriculum making from those educators. Um, this again is Danny, one of the educators, um, reflecting towards the end of the first phase of the project, where she says, I mean, I think a lot of it in terms of finding out about the children's interests, using it in your planning, it's the kind of thing that you do as an early years teacher anyway. But this project got us to delve a little bit deeper into the whys, not just this child likes cars, but what is it about that child in particular that, um, that, 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 um, that makes these cars important to them? So again, these are all reflections from the teachers. The project really made us think about how to make our curriculum more inclusive, more meaningful. The discussions that we've had have been really valuable. So instead of planning as individual um, educators, the team members now plan as a team so that they can share what they've observed about children. 
Um, so marrying up the children's interests within this very rigid framework in England, we did find can present some challenges as well. So it is about getting that balance right. And that's an ongoing dilemma and an ongoing process. Um, but the research has meant that we've gone right back to unpicking exactly why we do whatever we do. So thinking back to that initial question that I posed about what is curriculum, um, this is Ross, the head teacher, reflecting on his participation in the project um, and saying that curriculum isn't just the national curriculum in England, it's the interests of the children, it's the teacher's interests, it's their pedagogical approach. All of those different factors will have an impact on what curriculum looks like in a school. So just to round off before um, I finish and I open up for any questions that you might have, hopefully you can see how in England, the policy context creates these particular challenges um, that frame curriculum in, in particular ways where there's a danger that it's actually the, the national policy makers that drive who decides where it happens and the purposes and outcomes. And what we have tried to do in this project in very small, but I think significant ways, is to broaden the platform so that curriculum making becomes more of a democratic process where the decisions that are made about curriculum, yes, still involve those, those policy makers, but those policy makers come into dialogue with teachers, with children, with parents, with carers, with wider community members. So that the where it happens actually becomes the classroom and the family homes and the local community of the school, rather than some sort of centralized um, decision making that is sort of imposed down on teachers and children. So yes, the purposes are still um, about making sure that children make progress towards those learning goals, those outcomes in the English framework. But that actually, the purpose actually now at Wingfield foregrounds the children's interests and the children's intentions. And those early learning goals are integrated within that curriculum making process, rather than becoming the sort of the only drivers of that process. Okay, so that is me done. I really hope that it's been interesting for you. And I hope that the very different context that we're operating in within England um, has given you sort of pause, uh, pause for thought and, and reflection in thinking about your own context and how that, that, that differs perhaps in many ways to, to England. Okay, thank you, folks. It's a very English thing, isn't it? Thank you, folks. <laughs> Pure Ellis, thank you so much. They're such interesting examples that just show how rich children's everyday lives are. So thank you very much for, for sharing that with us. And there are many ways in which our seminar audience will be able to hear examples that do connect with Te Whārake and to think about what they're doing in their own practice. So something I would like to pick up um, on with you is this, while uh, educators, teachers do know children well, there is this idea of getting to know them really well that you talked about and that your uh, teacher referred to as, like, as Digging Deeper, a project that Maria Cooper and I led and collaborated on with teachers. We also uh, introduced home visits again. So home visits in New Zealand used to occur prior to, prior to children starting kindergarten, as you suggested, but they stopped really, when, and teachers told us this was because of increasing accountability and documentation requirements. However, the teachers in our project visited family homes asking those kinds of questions to specifically find out about funds of knowledge. It was so valuable, but we've had a lot of trouble encouraging teachers to extend their own use of non-contact time to engage in home visits. What, what would be your advice for our teachers as to how that helps you to make documentation more valid? And well, I'm, I'm, I don't want to give the answer, but <laughs> how can we extend this use of home visits for getting to know children at a deeper level? Yeah, thank you, Helen. And you know, this is a, that that is a question that when I've presented this research to um, educators in England, that question comes up as well. And I must say that that normally I would be presenting this with one of the um, the teachers from Wakefield, normally Jess, 
Um, and it would be great if I could sort of pipe Jess in now to, to talk about it. But I think that what Jess would say is that first thing is that you really need the support um, of your leadership team, um, whether you're based in a school or a kindergarten, you really need that leadership team to believe in the value of home visits. Because what has happened at Wingfield, for example, is the children, um, when they're beginning in the reception class, they begin a couple of days after um, the children in the rest of the school. And that enables the, um, the, the educators to do paired, they always go in pairs as, for sort of safety reasons, to do paired home visits um, um, during their, their sort of non-contact time rather than in their, their own personal um, time. Um, but I think, there were some people within the Wingfield team that were a little bit sceptical or a little bit nervous, perhaps, about doing home visits. But I would say that of all the changes that they made, the home visits have been the most significant one. Because I think meeting families and children on um, the family's territory rather than on the school territory, especially when you really, really make sure that, that families know we're not doing this visit to check up on you. We're not doing this visit like in England, you know, social services might do. We're doing this visit because we really, really want to establish a, a relationship with you. And what Jess and her team would say is that just visiting families in homes enables you to sort of see some of the things that are going on yeah. um, and offering families that opportunity to, 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 to say we, we are genuinely, genuinely interested in the things that go on at home really helps a little bit my a bit my, like my example of me with the deer um it helps the, the educators to make sense of the things that children are doing in their play mm -hmm. and to see how they connect with the things that are important um to, to, to the to them and their families at home yes thank you <laughs> yes and so i think there's a lot for us all to think about in in relation to to then how do we speak back to policy makers who are requiring a lot of this documentation on these early learning goals in your context. And so that's a question that's come from one of our um, guests this afternoon. Has there been any interaction with policymakers after this project started or once feedback was received from teachers? So what are you doing that we can learn from? Oh, gosh. Well, it is... I mean, I guess globally, but in England, it is, and, and I'm talking, it, it's really important here, I think, that I'm talking about England, not the UK, because um, the education policies in Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales are very different to in England. Um, and in England, it is really, really challenging for, um, to, 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 to make ourselves heard as, as, you know, advocates for early childhood education. Um, and I think what many people are thinking about is actually the way to make changes is by thinking about sort of, you know, grassroots, making those changes like we're doing at Wingfield. Um, because I think at the moment in the political context we're in in England, politicians are just not going to listen. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what we need to think about is very sort of practical and pragmatic ways in which educators can navigate the demands of policy while still remaining true to those principles and values that we all would share, I think, within that early childhood um, uh, community. Now, really interestingly, we, we have an inspection body that is dreaded in England called Ofsted, the, Offi the Office for Standards in Education. And Wingfield School, just a couple of months after the project finished, or the first phase of it finished, had an Ofsted inspection. And this is, I, I am answering your question, but probably in a very long wind, winded way. But um, Wingfield were actually um, graded as an outstanding school, which is the highest that you can get. And the early years was, see, was, was sort of um, highlighted as a particular strength. And the reason why that was, was because those educators, partly as a result of being on the project, but, but because they're wonderful educators, were able to articulate the reasons for what they were doing, what they were doing. And they were able to show very clearly how the ways that they were responding to children's interests were enabling children to make good progress towards the early learning goals. Um, but how their practice maybe looked very different to what it did in the school along the road. 
So in answer to your question, I think the way that we speak back to politicians is by creating those regular opportunities within the early childhood community for critical reflection and dialogue to enable um, educators to articulate um, in a confident way why they're doing what they're doing. Right, and couldn't, couldn't agree more. Wonderful presentation. Thank you very much, Liz. I'll just hand back to Justine to close the seminar now. Kia Helen, and thank you, Liz, for your presentation. Your discussion's a really timely reminder that curriculum is co-constructed with children and their families, rather than something that we deliver to them in a nice package. Um, and I'm sure that what you've shared this afternoon is going to prompt some really valuable ongoing conversations among our early childhood series, uh, seminar series community. And I know that even in the comments, people are already saying you've given them good food for thought and things to discuss amongst their teaching team. So that's really fabulous. Thank you. So Namahi Nui Ki Akwe Liz, thank you. We are really appreciative of your time and your sharing of your expertise and of that research. Uh, to our early childhood seminar series audience, if hearing about Liz's research has inspired you to do further study or research of your own, then the University of Auckland has a range of postgrad courses in early childhood education on offer. So please do go online and check those out especially our new online Master of Education in Early Childhood. And if you want to share or revisit this presentation, please check out our Early Childhood Seminar Series YouTube channel. The recording of this seminar will be available in a couple of days. And we're looking forward to seeing you all again in April when we're going to have a seminar with Professor Maria Brivoli from Aristotle University of Thessaloniki in Greece. So keep an eye on your inbox for the flyer and the registration information for that. Thank you again for joining us today and we'll close with karakia. Kia tau te rangi marie o te rangi i tu iho nei, o papatuanuku i tākoto nei, o te taiao i awhi nei, ki runga i a tātou, ki hei mauri ora. May the peace of the sky above, of the earth below, of the all-embracing universe rest upon us all. Behold, it is life. Take good care, everyone. Kakitiano.